Okay. So hi, everybody, and you're very welcome to our webinar, The Occupation of Play, with the two OTs that support Neurodiversity Ireland and the Sensory Centre in Black Rock. Um, so some of you may know them and some of you might not, uh, but this whole uh, webinar today is going to be about kind of helping your children and connecting with your children through play at home. And I'm going to give Megan and Jack the reins here in a moment, but just to make the, just to kind of let you know how this is going to work today, we're recording it. So it will be up on our website in a library. None of your faces or names will be seen. Uh, Megan and Jack are pinned. So they're the only people that will be seen and their presentation. Um, so if you miss it, if you have to drop out or something, for some reason, you can come back to the library. The other thing is that we're probably not going to be able to answer too many questions. We may take the approach of answering one or two from the chat, but we can't really get into specific children and specific needs without the OTs having met and assessed them themselves, really. So um, so if you have something really general that you want to ask, throw it into the chat. And if I get a chance at the end, I'll ask. The other possibility is you can ask your question at education at neurodiversity.ireland. And um, sorry, <laughs> neurodiversityireland.com is what I meant to say. So education at neurodiversityireland.com. You can send a question there after the fact, and I can forward it to Megan and Jack. But again, they won't be making assessments of children just through an email. So just to know that, that the question will have to be relatively general for them to be able to answer it. Um, so thanks for coming and thanks so much for Megan and Jack for agreeing to do this with us tonight. So really appreciate you guys staying after work late. You can see they're in the fantastic sensory center right now. So I'm just going to hand over to you guys and let you take over from here. And I'm here if you need me. Perfect. Thanks, Michelle. I'm just going to share the presentation. So just give me one second. Can everyone see that okay? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, we'll get started. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for spending your Wednesday evening with us. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Michelle. Um, like Michelle said, this webinar is to give you guys a bit of an understanding of the theory and the approaches that underpins our practice, um, as well as giving you guys some practical strategies that you can hopefully use at home. Um, like Michelle said, it is recorded, so you're able to rewatch it um, later on. And me and Megan are very happy to do any future presentations if there's anything specific and um, that people want kind of in the future. Um, there will be a booklet for these strategies being sent around in the next uh, week or two, as well as a feedback form. So um, don't worry too much about taking notes or things like that. There will be the information sent over to you um, in the next week or two. Um, so the agenda. Yeah, incorporate play strategies into everyday life. So we'll do a little bit of an introduction as to who me and Megan are, what occupational therapy is, our definition of play, the approaches and theory that we use. We'll talk a little bit about being a play investigator, as well as the practical strategies of looking at the play environment and incorporating focus interests and with a bit of a focus on social interactive play as well. All right, so who are we? Um, so Jack and I are both occupational therapists. Um, and as Michelle said, we are both currently working with Neurodiversity Ireland, running their OT-led groups and camps in the Black Rock Sen Sensory Centre. Um, and I suppose these groups are kind of the basis of what we're going to discuss in today's webinar and the reason why we're here today. Um, and our group sessions offer neurodivergent children an opportunity to access an extracurricular activity that is child-led, demand-free and inclusive of children with varying support needs. Um, and our overall aim, I guess, is to promote authentic, intrinsically motivating play and activities, as well as a chance to connect with other neurodivergent children. Um, we both studied occupational therapy in Trinity and graduated in 2016. We've been friends for a long time, so it's nice to work together. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, we've both been working as OTs since then, both in Ireland and abroad. Um, and in terms, I suppose, um, of our practice style, we consider ourselves OTs who are striving to be neuroaffirmative in our practice approaches. Um, and this is an ongoing process for us of learning um, and unlearning um, and listening to the neurodivergent community to inform what we are doing in our daily practice. Um, so it's a lot of reflective practice um, and ongoing learning and um, listening to the voices of the neurodivergent community. Um, sorry, I said that already. <laughs> and even things I suppose that we've said and done 
you know, a couple of years ago in our practice, like now we know maybe we wouldn't approach it that way. Um, and we're just trying to do things differently and do things better. Um, and we feel very passionate about providing spaces and opportunities within the community for neurodivergent children. And um, I suppose, yeah, that's why we're here today and involved in Neurodiversity Ireland. Okay. So what is occupational therapy? Um, in a nutshell, we support participation, but I thought it'd be helpful to give a bit of a um, breakdown of it. Um, as I know, it can be a bit of an abstract I suppose, concept for some people, but it's, it's quite simple um, in, in reality. So therapy, as everybody knows, is intervention intended to provide relief, healing or comfort. And occupations are professional jargon word it just means meaningful activity you should break occupation down even further so occupy means to spend time and also means to seize control so occupational therapy is supporting people to take control of their meaningful activities in their daily lives perfect and then we'd also like to provide a definition of what play is because play is the occupation that we're talking about today in our webinar um so play is said to be the true occupation of children. Um, and I, like we like to say that um, it is a child's job to play. Um, play itself is something that is self-directed by the individual. It's intrinsically motivating, something that you want to do. Uh, it is something that brings joy and fun and play is the process, process itself of engagement. And it's not about an end result. Um, and for children, as we all know, um, learning happens through play and the best type of learning happens through play. Um, and then a couple of comments then as well on neurodivergent play. I mean, there's so much we could talk about here and we'll go into some things obviously in this webinar. Um, but in a nutshell, I suppose neurodivergent play might look different to neurotypical play. Neurodivergent children may use play materials and toys in a way that's different or unexpected than maybe how they were intended to be played with. Um, they may like play that has a strong sensory component, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, they may like doing things like sorting and stacking, arranging, looking, moving things and things like that. Um, they may be playing out. Um, oh, actually, sorry, yeah, I just want to say a piece as well about not making assumptions about neurodivergent children's play. Um, and, you know, like listening to neurodivergent adults talk about when they were children and played, um, you know, it might not be something that's outwardly noticeable to us about what they're doing, but in their own head, um, you know, they might have a whole scenario of how they're playing. Like they might look like they're lining up these items, but to them, there's something so much more meaningful um, in, in going on in their head that might not be totally noticeable to me as, a, as an adult to see that and as a neurotypical person to see that. Um, and we know that neurodivergent people's social interactive play may look differently, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, and we know that many neurodivergent children um, and adults have um, intense focus interests and love to learn to saturation about things that they enjoy. Um, and uh, it's important then, with all that in mind, to say that all types of play are valid and that um, our neuroaffirmative approach means fostering true authentic play, no matter what that looks like for that child or that individual. Um, and just a kind of small note as well is that I suppose like the therapy world um, has kind of made play, you know, historically like a developmental process that children have to progress through and the goals need to be progressing them to the next stage of play developmentally. But actually play is about what brings joy um, and is motivating and that in itself is therapeutic if you're engaging in something that brings you joy um, in your authentic way that is therapeutic um, so play alone and engaging in play just engaging in play can be a therapeutic goal on its own um, perfect. perfect so we're going to discuss now some of the approaches that we implement to develop or run our OT groups and this information will provide a basis for the strategies and the ideas that we'll discuss later and um, we don't want to bore you too much with the occupational science, but it is helpful to know some of the kind of theory kind of, of why we do what we do. Um, so I'll let Megan start off. Perfect. So, um, yeah, uh, as I said uh, a few times, we uh, strive to use a neuroaffirmative approach. Um, so a little bit about what that means um, is um, what I suppose neurodiversity stands for neurological diversity. Um, but in essence, this approach encompasses a belief that being neurodivergent in itself is not a negative thing. It is just another form of diversity and variance among human beings and within our communities, and that it's not something that needs to be changed or altered. 
Um, and then having a neuroaffirmative approach um, means being against the ideals that in order for someone to be successful or have a meaningful existence, they need to be more neurotypical. Um, and, that, and I suppose our programs and groups do not try to steer our kids towards anything deemed to be less neurodivergent. Um, and in terms of the language we use, and we won't dive too, too deep into this, but um, we aim to listen to the disability community and the neurodivergent community and use the language of preference of those communities. Um, so, you know, we use identity first language, meaning, you know, autistic person or disabled person, neurodivergent person, etc. Um, and because these are not things that the person needs to be separated from, um, as this can increase the stigma um, and that it can be a positive and important aspect of that person's identity. And of course, we respect individual differences. If a specific person wants us to use different language when referring to them, we'd obviously honor that. Um, and we're kind of removing labels uh, like high functioning and low functioning. Uh, they are not representative of the complexities of an individual um, so we don't use terms like that. And if we needed to describe a neurodivergent child, we would instead try to give a like a little description of maybe their communication style, their preference, maybe some of their support needs, if that's relevant. Um, and we also don't we say verbal and nonverbal, and instead we say speaking and non-speaking. Okay. Yep. So this brings us to communication styles or communication needs. It's important that you respect each child's communication style. We don't request children to talk or to communicate with us if that's something that they kind of typically do. Um, we have previously observed in our sessions here that the kids begin communicating with us and with the other kids when there's no expectation or demand to do so. So that's through engagement in kind of authentic play and um, kids will naturally learn to communicate um what they want narrating what's going on and just learn to cooperate a little bit more with other kids maybe playing along with them um in instances uh, where they were regulated and they kind of felt safe here um for eye contact as well that's something that we're definitely not um forcing or kind of encouraging and um, it is important to know that even if your kid isn't looking at you in the eye they're always very aware that you're in the room they're always very aware that you're there um, and just them even tolerating you or other kids in their space um, is communication in and of itself um, stimming itself is is, is encouraged allowed um, and it's never to be discouraged you know some families can get a bit um, apprehensive and there's some stimmings like you know hip thrust stuff like that all of that we encourage as much um because it, it, it's it's a child's way of showing that they're trying to self-stimulate and um, to be able to participate um, in play um we don't have a focus on social skills we're kind of moving a lot an awful lot away from this or neurotypical social skills um, and towards a place of fostering genuine, authentic social connection in a meaningful way to the individual. Um, this looks different to a typical person's meaningful social interaction. So, for example, they may prefer parallel play and just tolerating somebody a meter away uh, beside them, replicating what um, toys they're playing with and what movements they're doing um, is... Um, communication and play um, as well. Um, the, we'll be talking a little bit more kind of about it later on, but just... Um, important to know that. Um, the PEO model then is one of the conceptual models that we used um, as occupational therapists. So P stands for person, E stands for environment, and O stands for occupation. Um, it's used as a way to interpret any given situation um, in order to guide where assessment or strategies might be aimed towards. Um, so we look at the interplay between the person factors. This is like motor skills, and cognition and social emotional skills, diagnosis, age, play styles, all factors that make that person them. And um, we look at the occupation itself, so we look at the task itself, and then the environment is, is one of the big things that OTs kind of focus on as well. And um, so there's loads of different types of environments we won't go into it today, but the two main ones we're going to focus on is the physical environment, which is the premises and furnishings of a place, as well as the social environment, which is the availability and support of family, peers, other people, and how they influence uh, participation as well. Um, what's really, really important to take away from this is that we don't focus solely on the person themselves I and mean, look at the interplay between the three of them. Um, and our jobs as OTs is to consider how these three factors link into each other. Um, another model that underpins our practice is called Bundy's model of playfulness. Um, it's another framework that we that we use to help us understand um, how children engage in play. It's based on three components. So we've got a sense of control, intrinsic motivation, and freedom to suspend reality. 
So children feel so looking at sense control first, children feel a sense of control over their play experiences. They get to decide what they want to play with, how they want to play with it, and who they want to play with. And this sense of control is, is important for fostering creativity, self-expression, um, intrinsic motivation then. It means that children have a genuine interest and are naturally drawn to play. It's fun, it's enjoyable, they don't need rewards. If they are rewarded with play, that turns into work. Um, children do it because they want to. Um, and then the freedom to suspend reality in play, children can let their imaginations run wild. They can pretend to be anyone they want, anywhere they want, um, and create their own make-believe worlds. If kids start making up their own rules um, in games, go along with it. Um, Bundy's model emphasizes the importance of these three areas um, for authentic play. And then the next um, a sort of approach, I suppose, that we're going to mention um, for our groups and for our practice is the DIOR floor time. Um, this is a huge topic, so I'm really just going to try and condense it into like two minutes of talking. But um, this is an approach that was developed by um, Dr. Gr Stanley Greenspan. Um, it's a respectful therapeutic approach to engaging with neurodivergent children and is based on the principles of developing an understanding of that neurodivergent child and getting into their world instead of striving to change them or make them more like neurotypical. Um, and to understand uh, what is truly motivating and what brings joy for the child is the essence of DIOR um, floor time. So the D is uh, stands for developmental process, which describes, um, you know, development from the perspective of that individual, where they are and perhaps where they're headed um, and understanding that that uh, developmental process is unique for that person um, and allowing space for that person to be respected and guided on their personal developmental journey. Um, the I stands for individual differences. So this is the unique ways each person takes in, regulates, responds to and comprehends the world around them. So this is the things that are specific to that child. Um, and then the OR stands for relationships. Um, so uh, that's describing how relationships, you know, fuel our development and our joy and our learning. Um, human beings, as we know, are social beings. Um, and we know that relationships are the key to all of our developments um, and well-being. Um, and DIOR promotes developing a truly trusting, authentic, emotional connection between the child and the individual, like the adult, um, whoever that is that's playing with them. Um, and it's really all about being where the child is at right now and celebrating this um, letting them dictate the pace of the play and development, supporting their genuine play and developing a connection with them through this um, and getting into their world. Uh, like I said, instead of expecting them to change, to be in uh, what, it, what is um, a prim primarily neurotypical world. Um, and it also you know, puts a lot of uh, emphasis um, on acknowledging that a child has to feel regulated and safe um, in order to learn and develop and connect as well. So that's really at the core of that as well. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit later on about some of the practical strategies that come from DIOR floor time. But like I said, it's a very big topic. Um, and so there and there are courses. I think the, the first course, DIOR um, 101, I think, um, you know, parents and, and um, uh, caregivers can attend that course. And it's actually really, really interesting and um, would definitely recommend that. Perfect. And then the other approach that we use in our groups and our practice is a sensory integrative approach. Again, another really, really big topic that I'm going to condense into one slide. Um, but uh, although in our sessions, we don't use a full sensory integration approach, we do use our understanding of sensory processing and sensory processing differences within the neurodivergent community um, to guide the approaches that we take um, and interactions that we have, and most importantly, to guide the environmental setup um, and how we're creating a space that is, you know, sensory friendly um, and, and what that might mean. Um, and it's important to mention that um, it's, um, I suppose, like sensory processing is a really, it's, it's a very essential aspect of our programs and uh, a really important, con in, in, in that it's a very important consideration for us, for the children that we meet. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into like sensory integrated theory, but it's important to know that there are eight senses, um, you know, our, our touch, uh, sight, hearing, um, sound and smell. But we also have these other three really important senses, our movement sense, our vestibular system, 
um, um, our proprioceptive sense, which is our awareness of our body in space, and our interoceptive sense, which is our understanding of what's happening inside our body. Um, and um, just a little another comment as well, I suppose, on sensory processing differences in the neurodivergent community is that, um, for example, we know from the kids that we meet that there are many neurodivergent children who have a heightened awareness of sound or touch. Um, so we might need to adapt the environment to accommodate that, or they may have an increased need to move their bodies or to get input to their bodies to feel calm and settled and safe. Um, they might need to have increased exploration of touch um, in their environment. They may have a preference for reduced visual stimulation, or they might seek and find joy from having access to lots of visual stimulation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation. Um, but I mean, we'd love to do a talk on sensory processing, um, you know, on its own sometime. But it's just an important thing, um, I suppose, for us to mention today as well. And then the final um, approach that we use, and um, probably the most one of the most important ones, is that it's a child-led approach, and exactly what it says in the tin. So, what works really well in this center is that for anyone that's seen it, there's multiple stations that we have. So we've got an arts and craft station, we've got a sensory room, we've got a cubby, we've got um, a climbing frame, we've got balance beams, we've got ball pits. Uh, Lego stations, there's there's just so many, um, and that works really well because as you know, kids' interests wanes and flows and um, they might be really interested in doing that and craft activity for 10 minutes then they might want to bounce for 20 minutes so um it's really good having as many stations here as possible and um, trying to replicate that at home and um, we would um recommend as a, as a helpful strategy um so children choose what they play with when they play with uh when, when they play with things and how they play with things and um, they control their own transition so because it's not demand free oh you have to do arts for 10 minutes before you can go and jump or you have to do and um, balancing for five minutes before you can and um, go to the sensory room and um, it's a bit of a as I said, free for all kind of child led um, approach that we have. And that works really, really well um, in the kind of play situation itself. Uh, we don't have any demands. So we don't say, oh, you have to come over here and sit for five minutes doing this task. Um, kids can can choose and direct kind of how they want to spend their time uh, when they're here. And then we, um, as the, the team, kind of dip in and out in terms of windows of engagement. Um, we so here it supports solo uh, play, parallel play, or joint play, so three different um, styles of play, which is really, really important. Um, we don't overly focus on skills, like we mentioned kind of earlier on, with all the approaches that we have mentioned, um, skills are continuously being worked upon. So um, the fact that there's multiple stations and kids can choose what where they go in between, um, they're automatically working on their motor skills, they're automatically working on their social emotional skills, they're automatically working on turn taking, communicating, um, everything like that. Um, DIY or floor time and bunnies model places are probably the two main ones that kind of, I suppose, influence our um, practice. Um, yeah. Being child led, yeah. Okay. Um, so now that we've talked a bit about some of the approaches that we use in our groups and things like that, um, you know, for you at home, um, maybe this might prompt, the next piece might prompt how you might um, support some of these things or use some of these approaches at home. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about like assessing your child's play, um, but instead, you know, like assessing sounds very clinical and stuff. So we're, we like to call it like being a play investigator. Um, and so for us, when we meet the children in our groups and sessions, that's kind of what we're doing. We're being a play investigator. Um, so really you want to use um, your own understanding of your neurodivergent child and their unique factors. Um, maybe thinking of some of the approaches we've talked about um, and um, some of the practical strategies as well that we're going to mention later. Um, but may maybe you might want to try and identify the type of play that brings your child joy. Um, and that might that's going to be how you're going to connect with them through um, play and engagement. Um, and so um, we really want to consider this in the context of what you're aiming to do, which is really, you know, hopefully to become a part of play with your child or a facilitator of play or enjoyment with your child. Um, and although we may be able to support a play idea to be expanded on or enhanced for your child, um, I suppose you just want to say like it's not about trying to like progress their play um, into to being something else. Um, it's about being on their level with what they're enjoying, um, understanding what that is, and then hopefully connecting with them through that. Um, so we really suggest taking time, as much time as, as 
as needed to like observe your child's play in a very non-judgmental way um, and just being present and being really curious about what they're doing um, and what about that might be bringing them some joy. Um, and so we've kind of composed like a list of questions and we'll put this in our booklet that we'll be sending out. Um, but that the questions maybe might prompt what you might, um, it might be what you might use to sort of guide your investigation of their play. Um, so things like uh, what truly brings your child joy? Um, do they find joy in novelty or in sameness and routine? Do they repeat play ideas over and over? Do they like to explore? Um, do they prefer familiar items, areas or toys? Are they creating something when they're playing or are they destructing something uh, when they're playing, which we see a lot of? <laughs> and what sort of items are they gravitating towards when they're in a play space? And if there's multiple things around, like what really captures them? Is there a specific sensory element to their play or their preferred toys, for example? Do they really like visual components and looking through things or at things or moving things? Do they like their whole body to be experiencing that play? you know, by by using a toy and, and, and adjusting their body movements? Like, is there a sensory component? Um, do they prefer to play alone, alongside or directly with? Um, what types of toys do they like? And also, what do they not like? Like, what has not captured their attention? And maybe thinking about why that might not have captured their attention or, or preference. Um, do they have a set play routine? Do they do a set um, of the same things every time? Um, and where do they play and why do they play in those environments and what is it about that environment maybe that with your understanding of your child might be the reason they're playing there and then I suppose ideally with a deeper understanding of your child's play um, you can consider how to engage with them then like using these ideas um, and you can provide maybe additional opportunities for that type of play that you've identified that they enjoy um, you can also then look at including others in that play if you know what brings joy. Um, and yeah, you can expand the opportunities that they have to play if you understand what is intrinsically motivating about the type of play um, that they engage with. And I guess all that's to say, this is kind of what we're doing in our groups all the time is we're doing a lot of observing trial and error and trying to see what it is about. I mean, we're in a massive room here with like all the most incredible toys and equipment. Um, and for us, it's so fascinating when the children come in and each child, you know, they they're so different and they gravitate towards different things for, or they might like the same things as each other, but they use it in a different way and they get something different from each other from it. So and we're using that then ourselves to try and introduce other ideas or to introduce ourselves into that play um, as well. So now the, the kind of rest of the, the presentation then is. Um, to sort of expand on practical strategies, like we could go on and on and on, but we tried to condense into stuff that we thought was most relevant um, that like we use in our groups that we see here and that might be, um, you might be able to replicate at home. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Jack. Yes, so like you mentioned earlier on with the PEO model, looking at the physical environment itself, um, it's helpful to think of, is there a dedicated space for your child to play? Does play happen in the living room? Does it happen in the bedroom? Does it happen in the hall? Um, is there a playroom that you guys have? Um, like what we have here in terms of multiple stations, um, having a designated space for play and different designated spaces for different types of play is really, really helpful. Um, like you mentioned with the sensory integration theory that we have, reducing as much visual clutter as possible just can help ground um, your child and you know, reduce symptoms of anxiety, can make them feel a bit more comfortable and safe. Um, so it means maybe cleaning everything up kind of beforehand. Um, and we can touch on a little bit later on, but, but if their play is messy, destructive play, allow them to do that. Don't focus too much on the cleanup or don't focus too much on the the the, the scale of the mess that they're making. And um, not great for parents, I'm afraid, but in terms of fostering play, that is kind of how you can get as much engagement and fun kind of out of it. Um, having a really clear floor space um, just allows the kid to have a bit of a um a world that they can navigate in and kind of use kind of how they want to and um, reducing background noise um, and s screens is something and we'd also recommend trialing and um, some kids really enjoy having you know YouTube on in the background some kids really enjoy having the TV on and um, 
it can be distracting. So maybe even putting on, um, you know, there's there's really good sound therapists um, that have devised different playlists. I know Marconi Union Waitlist is always one that I always recommend to parents. Um, maybe if they really like having the TV on, maybe they're happy to have it muted um, and have just a visual on kind of in the background. Um, rotating toys out so that, as I said before, um, kids' interests um, change so, so quickly over time. Um, depending on how, how large of a space that you have, it might be helpful to set up the play space before the kid um, comes comes home to play. So there might be a certain amount of toys that you that you might have for a number of weeks and you might switch it up again or you might switch it up every day. It kind of depends on your kid's own interest and you, you know, your kids um, the, the, the most. Um, giving as much choice as possible um, is a really, really great way to get your kids to engage with you. So instead of saying, do you want to play Chasing Yes or No? Do you want to play Chasing or Hide and Seek? Do you want to play with um, Paw Patrol or Roblox. Um, and like I mentioned before, setting up as much stations um, as possible. Um, even if your kid doesn't gravitate towards like arts and crafts um, the first time you lay it out, um, I would say, you know, it can be helpful to, to, to keep it there a few times. What we've noticed with some of our kids is they might come in and they might spend the first two or three sessions just bouncing on the trampoline, jumping in the ball pit. And after the third or fourth week that with the, the, the messy playstations that we have in the active graphs, they'll start to gravitate kind of in, in and out towards it. Um, so keeping things kind of constant and giving stations and having choice and um, just a really, really good way to, to get your kid to, to play with you. Um, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so this is, uh, these are just some strategies, I suppose, that are in our toolbox um, that we might use with the children we meet um, and that might be helpful for you when engaging with your child. Um, and they come from the, some of the approaches that we talked about earlier in the webinar about being child led, about, you know, DIY floor time and, and those kinds of things. And these, this is just a few examples. Like there's so there's, you know, we could go so deep with this, but um, we tried to kind of pick a few that might be most relevant. So, um, you know, a great one uh, is, is really getting down to the child's level um, or up to the child's level for us here if they're climbing and things like that. Um, but just being kind of with them where they're at physically um, observing the play without judgment. So, you know, being our play investigator um, and using that as a way to structure how we approach them. Um, you might narrate their play or narrate your play if you were playing with something um, just to bring, you know, their attention and awareness to you and that you are involved. Um, you might parallel play with them and that could be using, you know, uh, having a dupe to the same toys and you're playing, you know, with the same toy as them near them or in the same space as them. Um, or with a totally different toy, maybe they're playing with cars and you're going to play with animals and seeing what they prefer and, and um, you know, if they're, if they're happy for you to do that. Um, following their lead, um, moving with them. Um, so we would just, oftentimes you can see us chasing the kids around the center here. And if there's somebody who likes to move quickly between activities, we're going with them. Um, and as Jack mentioned earlier, we're looking for those windows of engagement. And um, so we're going with them, whatever they're doing. Um, we're going to look at whatever they're looking at and be curious about what they are, be, are curious about. Um, we're going to pick up on their cues. So are they happy in this interaction with me? Um, are they putting, um, you know, are they putting something near me or in front of me or, you know, indicating maybe that they um, might be happy for me to be there as part of that interaction um, and, and, and being involved um, and um do you know do are they if are they indicating that they don't want to be there and that's absolutely fine too and that means the window of engagement might be closed right now so i'm going to honor that and then maybe try again later um and um you know again about their signals are they indicating you know have you done something really engaging and are they indicating to you maybe in some way that they want you to do it again or um are they indicating maybe like leave me alone <laughs> and go away which is totally valid um maybe so for some kids you know we might sometimes after having observed for a long time and spent time with them and they're maybe comfortable for us to be in the space and maybe parallel play um, around them that maybe we might try and interrupt their play lightly in a very you know small way and see how that's received and you know if that's something that's fun or engaging we'll continue and if it's not then we'll obviously stop that immediately 
Um, and uh, we, like I said, we're always honor their preferences to be alone if this is in any way kind of communicated to us and try again another time because maybe this wasn't the right moment. Um, and then mirroring. So we often will do a lot of mirroring. So basically kind of copying what they might be doing and um, using the same toy or same sounds or words or showing our interest in some way. And that can be quite validating for children as well. Um, and we can, we're, we're quite enthusiastic people, so we would be doing that with a lot of enthusiasm. And that's lovely to connect and show that, you know, I see you and I see you're enjoying what you're doing and I want to be part of that. So I'm going to do that, too. And I'm going to express to you that that's enjoyable uh, for me as well. And, you know, that's that's a really special connection. Um, um, so, yeah, sorry. I, I suppose on the mirroring one, that's probably one of my favorite strategies to use with kids, especially the kids that um, are probably a little bit more... I suppose, less stereotypically um, interactive. Maybe the kids that um, will kind of sit and play in their own, solo players, parallel players. We found that mirroring their actions, mirroring their movements, and then mirroring their speech um, at their GLPs um, has been a really, really effective way to, to kind of get kids to um, engage with you. So that's be probably one of my favourite ones. Um, moving on then to sensory play. So it's important to remember when you hear about buzzwords like sensory, it's not just messy play with walls water, sand, you know, rice, things like that. Everything we do is sensory. We're, we're all sensory beings. Brushing your teeth is sensory. Going for a walk is sensory. Even standing still is sensory. Um, thinking about the eight senses that Megan mentioned uh, briefly earlier is, help, is helpful when thinking about what activities um, you can get your child to get your child to engage in. Um, like Megan mentioned about being a, a PI, a play investigator, you know, getting a sheet of paper and, you know, putting eight labels down on um, a piece of paper um, with the eight sentences, eight, eight senses as headings and um, have a like and a dislike column and just start writing down what you what you know about your child. What visuals did they gravitate towards? What music did they like listening to? What music did they not like listening to? What movement activities did they like? Um, and just tracking everything and that is, is just a really good snapshot um, and give you a really good indication of, of, of things that might might help. Like Google's a great resource and um, Pinterest is great. Like there's so many resources out there. I will send a few of the websites in the book that that will give um but definitely looking at all those kind of eight senses um and knowing what they prefer and what they what what what, what they don't like um is, is one of the key ways to get to get, get, get to get the guys get the guys to engage um so yes sensory play is not just messy play but in saying that um here's a slide of messy play um, so please remember the focus is on fun and not on skill development. So we're just going to give some examples of secondary benefits of messy play. Um, we wanted to mention today because in our groups, we just see so much joy when kids are engaged in messy play of all ages. Um, again, that is to say not all kids will enjoy messy play. And if you know your kid is quite um, so sensitive to touch input or um, has a really strong um, reaction when, when you're turning this, you know, we would not push it and we have to respect um, how, they're feeling about that, how they're feeling about that at that time. Sensory, um, I suppose, patterns change over time. So if it doesn't work now, that's fine. Try it again in a couple of months. Um, like I said, kids, kids grow and develop all the time. Um, messy play, it is, it's, it's so important for kind of overall global development that provides opportunities for children to explore different textures, different temperatures, different sensations, you know, through touch um, through sight and um, sometimes you know, smell and taste. Um, it supports fine motor skill development, such as finger painting, scooping up textures, pouring water, liquid over themselves. These types of activities are, are great for strengthening muscles in our hands and um, it's great for longer term development. I know that's something a lot of parents are really um um want a lot of advice on is fine motor skills so messy play is a really really good way to tackle that and you know have fun primarily um if you're worried about your child you might do a lot of kind of oral motor seeking um you know using edible versions of things is great again google pinterest twinkle there's so many things out there that's available and we'll, we'll send a few examples of some of, of some of our favorite messy play activities that we use um, we can find like, things for like non-toxic finger paint. Yeah, you can look up at using crushed up cereal to simulate sand and maybe mixing salt or, or lemons into some um, textures, you know, to really kind of defer any kind of future eating in the future. Um, but Messy Plays, is, 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 it's a really, really fun, um, it's a really, really fun activity. 
Um, it helps with language and communication. Uh, it encourages children to describe what they're doing, um, how things feel and so on. It's a great way for you as a parent to be able to role model language for them and to, to expand vocabulary and phrases in a natural context by narrating what's going on and by reacting to, to you know, the cause and effect relationship. Um, speaking of cause and effect, it's a really great way to enhance kind of cognitive development as well. It stimulates curiosity, creativity, and problem solving skills as they experiment with different materials and discover that cause and effect relationship. Um, it's great for emotional regulation as um, um, typically it can be a bit of, you know, it can be quite a calming and kind of therapeutic activity, anything that's, uh, you know, multimodal sensory kind of engagement. Um, it's sensory rich task. Um, and allows children to kind of release pent up energy to reduce anxiety um, and allows them to explore and express themselves quite freely without the constraints of rules or expectations. Um, it's in the title, Messy Play is Messy. Uh, if your goal is wanting to play with your child, allow as much mess as possible. Kids, neurotypical or not, find mess, chaos, destruction, so much fun and um, that's why we recommend having like a designated play space or outside especially with the summer coming up and just really let kids go all at it um i don't know if you can see on the background but our walls are covered with masterpieces of course um but like our aim for the end of our term here is to have as much of this white space covered because kids just really really love it because it's not something that they get to do rarely get to paint on the walls i would not recommend they paint on your living room walls but just having a dedicated space that they can just go all at it is it's just really really good um We'll give some, yeah, like I said, we'll give some examples of bestie play activities in our booklet. Um, and like I said, it is important if your kid is quite tactile aware, quite averse to, to certain kind of um, um, like tactile stimulation, um, really do not push it. Um, desensitization is not a neuroaffirmative approach, so it's just important to know that. Um, and then Another huge, huge way to incentivize and motivate your, your child to engage with you is their focused interests. Historically, these used to be called special interests, but a neuroaffirmative way um, is focused interests. So all of the evidence and feedback from the neurodivergent community, from evidence-based research, all says to allow children and adults um, to explore their focused interests as much as possible and incorporate these as much as possible into play activities to really maximize motivation, engagement, satisfaction, enjoyment, all those things. Um, like you mentioned in Bundy's model of playfulness and in our child-led approach, children are going to be more intrinsically motivated to engage in activities where their focused interest is woven into. And um, it's really hard to measure engagement statistically in terms of percentages and things like that. But there's a myriad of studies out there at the moment over the last number of years and all across the board. And um, they show uh, significant improvements in time spent playing um, in activities. And they showed improvements in uh, improvements, increased communication and increased cooperation and especially with other neurodivergent peers as well i think megan might mention it in a little bit but like we said about facilitating neurodivergent play dates or focused interest groups that is one of the key ways to get your kid to really open up with you and um, historically it was called info dumping but um I can't remember what the term of what it's called now. Um, but like passion sharing, like letting letting your child educate you on their focused interest um, is a great way for, for the two of you to kind of connect. And um, doing things like finding out fun facts about them um, and sharing it with them um, is great. We've got a few examples of like, I think it's the top 10 most popular focused interests that are out there um, on the slide there in front of you. Um, but it really does, it really does depend on the person and changes so much over the lifespan as well. Um. One of the reasons why our groups are so effective here in BlackRock is that we try to match play style um, and interests as much as possible as we can. Um, I know you guys all have uh, you know, WhatsApp group and, and things like that. And um, we try to recommend that you can see if you can find other parents um, of kids that have the same interest kind of as your kid uh, and recommend facilitating something uh, like a play date or a group uh, to facilitate participation in those interests. I and mean, that can be, you know, arts and crafts space. It can be movement space, making obstacle courses. It can be um, even getting your, your other neurotypical children um, involved by them, you know, making collages or by them, make, you know, drawing out, colouring in kind of outlines. Um, that is definitely one of the, 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 the best way to get, to get your kids on board. Um, 
we can do a separate presentation on support neurodivergent playdates and, and, and focused interest groups, um, but having choice and variety is key. Like I mentioned, like I mentioned earlier, by having multiple stations and um, giving as much choice and variety just really instills a sense of control um, to your child. Um, and as well as holding it somewhere kind of external. So if you are having playdates, for example, or, hold, or holding groups, not to have it in somebody's house, do it somewhere objective like uh, a park or a beach or, you know, jump zone, things like that. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So here's some, ex we picked animals just as a random example, but you can just substitute animal with what your kids um, special and in or focused interest um, may be. Um, for example, and like, like I said, the list is endless of what they can be. So for example, some of the kids that we have um, is quite a broad range. So we have one kid who loves vegetables as a group. We have one kid who used to just love potatoes. And um, we have one kid who loves countries, another kid who loves logos. So it is so broad and it's so diverse. And an awful lot of time, there might be um, two or three interests that they might have. And it's, it's important to know that to them, they're the expert on the subject and to let them educate you and teach you as much as they as much as they want to share with you. And um, it's really, really, it's a really nice way to, to get, get, get them to engage. Um, like learn from them, share fun facts with them about it. Um, like I mentioned, in terms of the variety of activities that you can do, getting books about the focused interest, um, getting cutouts um, of the focused interest to make collages, posters, and um, things like that to help decorate their bedroom or decorate their play space. Um, in terms of any kind of movement-based activities, doing obstacle courses, whether that's, you know, a, a, a train track, whether it's a, um, an animal safari or a zoo, whether it's a Jurassic Park-style obstacle course, um, you know, getting as much paint, as much colour, as much um, exposed just um, visual stimulation as possible is a really, really nice way to get kids um, engaged. Um, and then in terms of the sensory and the, the, the messy play, you know, play figurines, um, you know, a lot of kind of, you know, treasure hunting, you know, if you've got a, like a rice bin or a water play um, and putting their focus interest figurines so and getting the kids to to figure, to dig in, fish them out and line them up, stack them up, whatever it kind of may be. Um, it is just important to know that if your child is really in the flow or kind of hyper-focused doing a uh, an activity related to their um, focused interest, we wouldn't recommend interrupting and kind of letting them have that space to really get in the, the groove of what they're doing and then naturally come to a transition um, once they're done with that activity. And that's a really good time to dip in then rather than interrupting the mid flow. It can cause a lot of anxiety and a lot of kind of um, disruption um, to their kind of thought process and with it. Um, no matter what the focused interest might be, we recommend, you know, not limiting it, not, you know, don't discourage it, don't make fun of it, even if you meant it as a joke, you know, it, to them, it's, 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 it's sacred, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a ritual, it's something that's so integral to kind of who they are. Um, we would never recommend for it to be used as a reward, you know, just incorporating them into other activities so that you're showing them that you acknowledge their interest, that you, you know, are wanting to be involved in it, um, and yeah, creating materials as well. Um, yeah, super. So, um, again, another big topic, but we're going to talk a little bit about uh, supporting interactive play. So for you as the adult um, and then also with, you know, with other children and other people that might be in that neurodivergent child's life. Um, and I suppose it's really important to say, um, you know, a positive social experience can look very different for different people at different times and in different contexts. Um, and in, in, in order to build upon social interactive play, it's important to understand your child's uh, like style of social interactive play and whatever that might look like for them. Um, and we don't necessarily want to change this. And that's a big shift, I think, in kind of recent like therapy world is that, you know, we don't like teach social skills and things like that. We're not trying to change a person's social interaction style. Um, we're, but we're trying to build a rapport and trust and engagement with them. Um, and by understanding what is socially motivating for that child, uh, we can naturally build our involvement within their play using that knowledge and also support inclusion of siblings and other children or adults in their play as well. Um, and for us in our groups, 
Um, like I said, we're not going out with a goal to like, you know, develop turn taking skills, but we do find that these types of skills develop naturally when we approach the children with that kind of lens of acceptance um, and validation for their type of play and their social interaction preferences and really honor whatever they are that just naturally those kind of social skills just develop like they do for any child naturally. And um, if we provide opportunities for positive play and interaction. Um, and, you know, if a child is unsettled by a social experience, they aren't going to be regulated enough to want to share their toy or to allow our involvement in their game or et cetera, whatever that looks like. Um, but if they have a rapport with us, if they feel that they're safe to play in their own way um, without the demand to do it differently, um, then they are likely are going to open up their play to us and present their own opportunities um, for those kind of play skills to develop. Um, and I suppose that takes a bit of pressure away as well for us as therapists and maybe for you parents to know that you don't have to be like changing, you know, the way that their social play presents. Um, but you can, you know, le learn to understand it and then be a part of whatever that is for them. And then just tying it back into like that play, being a play investigator and assessing, um, you know, their play, we can also be an investigator about what a positive social experience might mean for that, that specific child. Um, so these are just some examples and um, do they prefer parallel playing and um, so you know maybe you or another child is in the same space playing with the same or different toys and um, do they prefer for their lead to be followed by you um, or do they want a very reciprocal kind of back and forth interaction where you're both really involved in developing the play idea um, or do they want to follow your lead because you're doing something really engaging and um motivating that they want you to do you know blowing the bubbles or um you know sending the race car down the track or whatever um and they want to follow your lead with that because you're making that really fun and engaging for them um maybe it's just that you, you know that the child today or in general or whatever just likes sharing that space with somebody um Maybe um, they want to share enjoyment, as Jack said, with about a common interest. And that's a really positive social experience to be maybe engaged with that com that that focused interest in the same place or talking about that interest um, or whatever that might be. Or maybe they want to do like trading and turn taking and showing you or somebody else, you know, showing what they've done or played with or created. And, and this is really not an exhaustive list. It's just some ideas and some things that we think about. Um, and like in general, um, you know, we really try to validate, like I said, whatever that positive interaction of play or leisure looks like for that individual child um, and that it is valid and accepted. And like I kind of like to give an example, um, you know, as an adult, um, like for me, say there's times when, um, you know, like I'm a very outgoing social person. I love to be around people and that. But um, there are a, a, for me a lot of the time a positive social connection for me could be reading my book in the same room as my partner who's reading his own book or cooking dinner or listening to music and we're not speaking to each other we're not even doing the same thing but we're just in a space together um, and sharing that and that is that feels connected and um, that feels like a positive social experience for me um and i think that's a really like nice way to think of like the kids that we meet to that you know maybe they're just they're really engrossed in that activity on their own and maybe i'm just there with them and um through that we're finding um and providing comfort to them safety joy and connection through that type of interaction um and um i suppose like you know in general then that kind of ties in with like picking up on their cues as well so is your involvement, whatever that involvement level is, and uh, whether it's just being there or whether it's commenting on their play or directly engaged in their play, is that enhancing their experience of this play? Um, or is this a time where they are, would prefer to play alone or prefer for you to be involvement differently? And I said earlier about, you know, it depends on the context, the day, the place, the time, all these different things. Like maybe today your child wants to have this like, you know, game with moving the dinosaurs around and making a thing for the dinosaurs to go on. But maybe tomorrow, um, you know, they just want to do that and show that to you and create it on their own and show it to you. And that's your involvement. And so picking up on their cues about what they might like in this current moment um, and then really honoring that and building trust by honoring that. 
Um, and then I suppose, you know, overall, um, it's really about focusing on creating a connection uh, between you and them. Um, and then some um, some interactive play um, strategies might be, you know, ways to use yourself. And um, so thinking of your tone of voice. Um, for some of the children we meet, they really want like a super engaging, high, you know, really like high intonation, like, and that's very engaging, but for another child or the same child on a different day, maybe they want like more quiet and, and that's, you know, what they, that, like, that's really important to pick up and use as well. That's a tool for you to use um, your facial expression, your gesture, your things like that, your body language, how much movement you're doing or relaxed you are your level of enthusiasm as well. Um, you know, children really pick up on our energy and if we're really enthusiastic about what they're doing, you know, they feel that and then they want us to connect with them. Um, if they feel that we really are enthusiastic about what they're enthusiastic about. Um, and then, yeah, like matching their activity level. So kind of connected what, to what I said about tone of voice, um, you know, if their activity level right now is very quiet, like maybe they come home from school and they just want to do really quiet, relaxing play, um, we're going to go in maybe and try and do the same type of play um, but maybe on another day it's like high level energy levels like well, rough and tumble tickles chasing and and we're matching that energy level that they have um as a way to kind of get into their world and and engage with them um and then i'm not really going to go into it because but um you know we know that many of the children we meet are gestalt language processors um, and, you know, Neurodiversity Ireland have shared lots of resources and information, you know, and are, are continuing to do so about what this looks like. Um, but maybe it's just something to keep in mind if you know your child is a GLP, um, that this is going to, you know, maybe change how you might communicate with them through play. Um, and then we did just kind of want to mention as well, when we're thinking about interactive play, and, you know, as, as an individual going, you know, into an interaction with a child to develop that connection with them, really thinking about co-regulation and, and checking in with yourself. Is this the best time for you to be engaging in play? Like, you know, have you had a bad day? Are you a bit stressed out? Is there lots of things on your mind? You know, what are your energy levels like? Like, what do you need right now? Um, children pick up on our energy levels and our regulation levels, um, and they're so in tune to that. Um, so it's really important to see how you're doing in this moment. And, you know, if you're in that place of like trying to get into their space or do you just need your own space, <laughs> which is completely valid. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe if this isn't the right moment, then maybe don't use this as your moment and and, and pick a different moment instead as well. Um, and then we do just want to say as well, which we do a lot of here is about embracing silence. Lots of neurodivergent children prefer not for there not to be a lot of spoken language during their play and um, now some children like want that but there are lots that we meet who don't and um, so be okay with not talking or using a small amount or limited language and that's completely fine um, and appreciate that this can still be a social experience even if it's not involving talking um and then uh, yeah a bit about then um supporting positive play interactions for your neurodivergent child um with you know, maybe siblings who are neurotypical or cousins or peers or other adults who are in their life. Um, and so we would really recommend, you know, modeling what works for them, like showing them, oh, you know, she really likes it um, when I do the same thing that she's doing or she really likes it when I just sit and, you know, play my own thing near her or whatever that might be. Um, and kind of showing them what that might look like. Um, and that will help maybe to develop that connection between them and um, maybe as well, like back to what Jack was saying, using that shared interest that maybe those that neurodivergent child and their sibling or peer or whoever have. Um, and it doesn't even always have to be their like focused interest, but maybe they love rough and tumble play. Um, so maybe you can kind of show your, your, you know, the neurotypical child or adult, you know, ways to engage in that in a really um, meaningful um, way that brings joy. Um, or maybe they like building Lego or listening to songs together. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, but that could, you know, it's, it's again, trying to get into their world and then show others that, you know, we don't have to expect that child to play the way you play, but maybe you can play how they play and, and connect with them in that way. And then, yeah, like, I mean, when we already talked about play dates and as Jack said, that's a whole thing we could go into on its own. But um, I did just want to say, you know, advanced planning can be helpful for arranging play dates um, and thinking about things like, would it be very beneficial to allow 
free play during the play date or would the interaction benefit from some adult guidance so um this could help to reduce the social demands of the situation and some of the anxiety that comes with like oh what am I supposed to be doing and saying and thinking and blah 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 um and it removes that like what are we going to do together because maybe you know you've said if you know those two children like doing art maybe you just have a, an art activity set up and you're not you know leading the activity necessarily but you're kind of prompting and guiding it um and maybe it's an act lego activity or whatever shared interest um and maybe that's like jack said going out into the community if the two children like the animals example like maybe can they go to the zoo together or or whatever that might look like um and like a play date doesn't have to be many many hours like it could be 30 minutes mm -hmm. of getting together doing an art activity and and leaving it at that and that's a really positive social connection and that might be enough um and then I suppose like at the core of all of this and you know any other strategies that you might have and that you use it's really about building trust and safety within that interaction so think long term you know like maybe today your involvement is to be present only and this might remain that way for a period of time. And then maybe your child might indicate after a period of time that they're comfortable for you to be more included in their play. And Jack and I see that a lot in our groups. Um, and I think you said earlier as well, like some of our children will come and, you know, for the first, it could be three, four, whatever weeks, they do the same thing on their own. And, you know, maybe we just dip in and out of being present. And then like what we're seeing is that over time, then that can develop, um, you know, maybe then, you know, by doing some of the strategies that we talked about and, and showing them that we're not going to interrupt or change or try and ruin what's happening, you know, the game that they're playing and that they can trust us that we're finding then that we can increase our engagement in their play with them. Um, so I did just kind of want to, to mention that as well. Um, and I'm conscious of the time and thankfully because this is our last slide and I suppose the key I guess takeaway from all that like theory and everything is that it's really all about having fun um and nothing we've really spoken about today matters if the child and you are not having fun and it, you know children know like they don't want to do things that aren't fun so if it's not fun it's probably not right um and if it's not fun it's not a positive play experience so really you know, if in doubt, just think like, what is fun and, and, and run with that. And that's it. Thanks so much, guys. I have two really general questions. If you don't mind just having a quick um, stab at them, the, I'm sure you know the answer oh. to this one. How long are the sessions that you're doing at Black Rock? Um, an hour long, weekly, an hour long. Great, thanks. And then the other question, now I'm not sure that I fully understand this because it's slightly outside of my depth, but um, they're asking, why do you not do full sensory integration approach? Well, so to do full sensory integration approach, you have to be SI trained. So there's six modules, I think, in total, um, and they cost a couple of thousand euros. So, so um, the, there's like a whole list of designation things around as having a certain type of sensory gym. And it's very much individual goal related. And I, to be honest, I have mixed feelings about it in that often goals might be to change that person's social or um sensory uh processing um like skills or or and things like that and so um it's something that we have kind of are debating on an ongoing basis as a therapy world and ot world um so i suppose for us like as well like i mean sensory integration is one component of when we look at maybe the children yeah. we meet and so we feel that a more like having multiple lenses of looking at that child and their world and the different um components of them and their environment we find that that really works for us and it kind of covers multiple things we do have a very strong sensory lens on what we're doing but um it's I, about specifically si yeah um, theory it's our si theory itself that's a great, guys. Thank you so much for your time tonight. And thanks to, to Rethink Ireland, a social innovation fund who is helping us to present these webinars. So thank you very much uh, to all of you. And if you're curious about the Black Rock Sensory Center, you can find us online, neurodiversityireland.com. Uh, we're going to create a little library. We've started creating a little library. So this presentation will be up in our library eventually. Um, and also, if you want to get in touch with the center directly, Bailey is the teacher who does all of the needs matching. So she's Bailey at neurodiversityireland.com. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And so much thanks to J Jack and Megan.
Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Nice. Bye, bye. Bye. Nice. Bye. Bye, bye.